the joy of seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoe boxes for the first time in their life. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each heart, all these little children around the world. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and to bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one. We are in October, but we got to be thinking Christmas just like Walmart, you know. So um, it is Operation Christmas Child time. Some of you see these boxes and recognize them. Some of you are like, what's that all about? What we, what we ask people to do is fill these boxes up, and these boxes are simply going to go to children all around the world who wouldn't get a Christmas gift otherwise. And also what goes in here is they're going to put a gospel track in here. And these kids that all aren't only going to have the joy of the toys that are in there, they'll also be exposed to the hope that's found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And then a lot of these places, they'll have what they call the greatest journey. It's a discipleship program that will follow up with these children. And it kind of walks them through the gospel and what Christ did for them and just all, all about that. So um, op awesome opportunity it's a simple thing to make a huge impact on children all around the world and to help spread the gospel all around the world. It was exciting. We have some missionaries that, that we support that are down in the Yucatan portion of Mexico. And when they were here, they were showing us pictures of kids receiving these boxes, but also they were telling us about the kids who graduated from The Greatest Journey, that they took them through this program and the kids that went through that. So just such a joy of hearing all that. And you can be part of that. So pick up boxes as you're leaving. We need to get them back here to us by, uh, say, November 24th. If we can get those boxes all back to us by then, it will be great. So don't procrastinate. Pick them up, fill them up today, and get them back to us. Uh, but we are um, excited about what God will do through those. It is an exciting time at First Baptist Church. We have a lot of stuff going on and coming up. Uh, maybe you're new and you've been figuring out what all is going on here at First Baptist? Uh, well, we have Discover FBCO that takes place next week, a uh, week from today. And if you come to the early service, you can go straight to this class that kind of tells you a little bit about who we are, uh, what you can do to get plugged in, what you can do to join. Some of you say, well, we don't really have an altar call right up here at the end. I don't know how to join First Baptist Church. Well, go into that class. We'll give you a great opportunity to be able to do that. So you can sign up in the lobby there before you leave today. Uh, contact Liz Morris, and we can get you signed up and part of that class next week. Also, if it's your first time, we'd love to give you a little gift. It's out there in the lobby. If you want to pick that up at the Welcome Center, if it's your first time to visit with us, you can also text Welcome to the number you see up there on the screen, and we'll get some more information to you about First Baptist Church. We do have our car carnival coming up, so keep bringing uh, candy in and signing up for booths that you can um, work out for our car carnival. Also, love our community. We spent a lot of time talking about that last week. It's where we just go in and out into our community and, and share the love of Christ and different ways of acts of service. So if you're not part of a group yet, make sure you get signed up <clears throat> out there in the lobby today before you leave. Maybe you just want to form your own groups. That's great. Uh, sign up online. You can go to fbco.org to sign up, or you can scan one of the QR codes you see. Get signed up. We'll get church to you starting this Wednesday for that. Also, we have church conference today at 2.30, and I'd love for you to join us at that as well. Thank you for joining us in worship. We invite you to stand to your feet. Let's honor the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord from our, from our hearts as we worship together.
the gates, make way before the King of Peace. God comes to save, He's here to set the captives free. You decide the Lord of my Our God is the liar, the liar of Judah. He's holy.
I love to hear you sing. It would be better for me if we turn the microphones that way to hear. Because you guys just sound amazing. So thank you so very much for lifting your voices and singing. And, you know, you can just get a sense of sincerity as we sing and as we, as we just, just express ourselves to a loving God who loves us so much. So thank you. Thank you for the love that you share. Thank you for giving of yourselves. Thank you for your presence in this place. I want to pray for you. I just want to l just lift you up in whatever's going on in your life. Um, for the victories, for the defeats, for the struggles, for the perplexities, I just want to pray for you. God, I just thank you for these people today, and I just ask you just you'd be with them, that they would see in you uh, a, a direction and purpose and answers that, that maybe they're looking for. Lord, most of all, may they just see your, your love for them. And because of that love, that may that, may that bear in them a, a, a reckless love, a love that knows no boundaries, a love that, that, that moves beyond the walls of a church into a community that needs to hear about you. And not even a community, but into a world that seems to somehow just be spiraling out of control. God, we just thank you. We thank you for this, this body of believers, and we pray that you would, you would know each and every heart. God, if those who are struggling today with relationships or finances or health or finances, or whatever it is, God, that they'd find their answers in you. God, perhaps today, very likely today, there's somebody in this room, they've never come to the place of saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. What you did at the cross, God, I want it to count for me. I want the, the blood to, to, to cover me, cleanse me from all my sin. I make you the Lord of my life. I pray that today that they'd not leave this place until they said make, they'd make that right. God, I pray that all that we would do would, would, would demonstrate your love and your character in our lives so that we may grow and more and more to be like you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
seated. Good morning, church. Uh, welcome to First Baptist Church Orange. If you're a visitor, we're, we're glad to have you here. Let me start off by saying, uh, isn't it amazing that we get to come together and, and worship with this amazing praise team? Amen, church? Amen. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not a dancing Baptist, but, uh, but every now and then on Sundays, I'm, I'm tempted to pull a David. It says, David danced before the Lord. When, when John Bickham goes to that high note in Waymaker, I'm like, oh, there it is. I tell you what. So, um, but it is a joy. And I tell you what, when we're together worshiping church, it is a glimpse into eternity. Because the book of Revelation says this, every nation, every tongue, every tribe, all divisions erased will worship around the throne. Of God, and if that doesn't give you chills, I don't know, I don't know what does. Amazing, but I tell you what, it's a privilege to serve here at First Baptist Church with an amazing staff. Uh, you know, John and Trevor are on stage leading us in worship. Shelley is helping herd about a hundred kids, and uh, and Jason is sort of the glue that he's filling all these potholes on Sunday morning. Amazing team, amazing group of volunteers, an amazing church body that we have. And so this morning, let me begin as we continue to work through the book of Ephesians. I want to ask you, have you ever felt like you were on the outside looking in? Uh, Where you you just feel like, um, you know, I think we can all relate to that at some level, where you just feel like you're not part of the club, whatever the club is, where you don't get picked for the team, or maybe there was a time when all your friends got together and you didn't get the phone call and you just felt left out. That happened to me once. it's probably happened to me more than once. I don't get the phone call a lot. But once that I remember specifically, I was about 14, and my two very best friends, they went to the movies without me, and I didn't get a phone call. And I was kind of like, well, man, that's a, it's a, pretty big, it's a pretty big bummer. And come to find out, they said, well, we didn't invite you because we knew your parents wouldn't let you go watch this movie with us. And I said, well, you're right, but it would have still been nice to get a phone call to feel included. And the truth is, this has been going on for just about all of human history. Uh, part of man's sinful nature is to build barriers, to erect boundaries, to exclude others, to think that others are beneath us, to think um, that we're better or to, you know, gravitate to, toward the people that we think are, are powerful or popular or to judge other people based on superficialities. But deep divisions have developed between different groups of people. Why is that? Well, it's because of sin. We talked about last week that sin leads to death. And, and sin and death is a, is a separation. When you die, you're separate, your body is separated from your soul. When, when our loved ones die, we're separated from them in death. Uh, sin calls our spiritual death where we're separated from God. But also sin calls us the separation within relationships as well. Sin calls us the death and deterioration and breakdown of relationship with other people. It's cause and effect. We reap what we sow. When we sow sins, we reap death and sometimes that shows up in the relationships with people around us but as we read the new testament we see these these divisions that are that are present and we see all throughout the new testament this instruction that believers are to walk in unity that believers are to practice the ministry of reconciliation where we we bring people together in the time that the New Testament was written, like today, there were large divisions between different people. There was a division between slaves and free men, where the, those that had their freedom looked down on the slaves, and really they just saw them as property. Uh, and so they looked down on it, but then there's writings in the New Testament that talks about the equality that we have in Jesus Christ, where whether you're slave or free, there's this unity, and so we should treat all people as equals and with respect. We see in the time that the New Testament was written in the ancient world that that women were looked down on. Ladies, be glad you're born when you were born and not thousands of years ago because women were, were looked as little better than slaves. They were looked on as property. They were inferior. 
Then you had the, the race of the Greeks. The Greeks felt this. They said, if you're not a Greek, you are a barbarian. They saw every other race as inferior to their own. And so in the early church, as the church was being established and growing, there were these tensions that existed between Christians uh, that were Jews and Christians that were Gentiles, but also between believing Greeks and other Gentile believers. There was just these, these divisions, these walls that were erected. And it's a part of our sinful nature to think that we are better than other people. And for thousands of years, man has been trying to elevate himself or his group above others and to push other people down. But here's the amazing thing about the gospel to me, is it gives value to all people, to all races, all nationalities, both genders. Many see the gospel, many see Christianity as a message that has devalued women, when in fact it has elevated and raised the status of women. Because the message of the gospel elevates everyone to an equal place. And there are theories today about social justice that says the gospel is just one means of one group controlling another group. And if people have that mindset, I'm tell you, here to tell you that they don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel preaches that there should be no divisions within the body of Christ. We all stand condemned before Christ. We are all loved by Christ. Christ died for all. We can know him and we can all be rich in him. We can all partake in his glorious inheritance. So in Christ there's no barriers, there's no classes, there's no walls, there's no caste, there's no races. We're all one in Christ. Oh, that we could remember that. Oh, that we could live that out as the church. The riches found in Christ are made available to all. Everyone can have an inheritance. And so we've been working through the book of Ephesians together. We've made it through Ephesians 1 and the first half of Ephesians 2. Today we're going to jump in in a few moments to Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11. And so far we've seen this, that God's people have this abundant wealth. Now we're not talking about material wealth, and sometimes it's easy as believers, as people, to look into the lives of others and say, man, it must be nice that they have that, or they got a new car, or, or they're able to afford the vacation that I've always wanted to go on. And we, we look and we compare ourselves, but here's the truth. We all have so many blessings as Christians. We have no business even making comparisons because we're all so rich in that we have access to Jesus Christ. We have a future. We have a hope. We have meaning in Christ. And so Paul's prayer to the Ephesian church was that they would realize this inheritance, that they would know how good they have it, how rich they are in Christ. And last week we talked about some of those riches when we talked about what's so amazing about grace. And we said grace is the free gift of God, that you can't good your way up, that you can't work for it, that he gives it to us freely, that he's rich in grace and mercy and love, and he extends all that our way. So this week, Paul continues this theme, reminding us that, that riches are available to all, that there should be no division within the body of Christ, because we all have access. God hasn't given more to one group than the other. The body of Christ is one. We all share in this rich, rich inheritance as Christians. So if you're following along with us this morning, we're going to begin Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. And we're going to start off talking about this separation that exists. Look at verse 11 with me, Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Twelve, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We see that Paul begins this section with the word therefore, and we've talked about this before. When the word's therefore, what do we have to ask? What is it therefore? There you go, you're paying attention. And so why is therefore therefore? It's a connecting word. It's connecting what we talked about last week, that God extends this grace, this marvelous, amazing grace to us. And Paul is saying, Gentiles, with that in mind, remember who you were. Remember what life was like for you before Christ. It's a connecting word. Well, the unfortunate thing is in the Ephesian church at this time, there was this division, this disunity, this separation between church members, primarily between Jews and Gentiles. And maybe you're new to church, you know, sometimes we use these churchy words, um, the, the Jewish nation, 
uh, had this covenant with God, and then there were the Gentiles. That was everybody that was not a Jew. And often the Jews looked at the Gentiles as being outsiders, as being outside of God's plans and his covenant. But we see Paul talking today that there should be no division among believers. One group doesn't get more of Jesus than the other. In fact, Paul would write in the book of Galatians, Galatians is also amazing, maybe we'll work through it one day. Galatians 3.28, he says this. He said, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. No distinctions. Any division we create amongst believers, Scripture says is sin. Any division we create amongst believers, any hostility or animosity. Now, I understand there are, there are doctrinal and theological issues that we stand on, but we don't create disunity amongst one another. God chose the Jews to be his special people, but also so they could be a blessing to all men throughout the ages. Because we know from the Jewish nation would come the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself, and the whole world would be blessed. The Jews were chosen to be a light to the world. They were to spread the knowledge of God. But unfortunately, Israel did a miserable job of living out the calling that God placed on this special group of people. Israel condemned the Gentiles. They further erected these barriers rather than witnessing to the Gentiles. God's plan has always been to share his grace and love and mercy with all people. But as we said, it's been the nature of man to create division, to build walls, to seek to isolate and exclude other people. And the Jews did just that to the Gentiles. They wanted the Gentiles judged, not forgiven. And maybe we're like that as Christians sometimes too, where we look at people outside the faith and we see what they say about our God and we see what they say about Christianity and we see the things they're doing. Maybe sometimes we're tempted to say, "Mm -mm -mm, you're not a Christian, you deserve what you get. That's not a biblical attitude. Because Christ would have us be the light. Look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Paul points out this division between Jew and Gentiles. The Jews looked down on the Gentiles. In fact, they would do this. Whenever they had to travel abroad, before they walked back into Israel, they would take off their sandals, they would click the dust off and put them back on because they didn't want that Gentile dust. They didn't want it defiling Israel. I'm not making this up. Samaria was a, they were half-breeds. They were half-Jews and half-Gentiles. Jews would walk all the way around Samaria so they didn't have to cut through it because they didn't want to be defiled by these Gentiles, by these Samaritans. And so the Jews looked at the Gentiles lacking this physical mark of circumcision that the Jewish community had. The Jews thought the Gentiles were of no concern to God. But circumcision wasn't a mark of personal relationship with God. Abraham had a relationship with God far before this rite was initiated. And so now Paul points out a spiritual separation. Before Christ came, the Gentiles were separated from God. So he's showing the Gentiles, he's saying, hey, look how bad you had it before Christ, but also you Jews, you were supposed to point him to God, and you didn't. So this is a reminder to us as well as most likely Gentiles. See what Paul has to say. Five things, five ways that the Gentiles were cut off. Look at verse 12. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Paul says this. He says, Gentiles, you were without Christ. There was a time where we also were without Christ. We were separated. No hope of a Savior because this promise of a coming Messiah was made to the Jews. Now, God had bigger plans that it would be extended to all men and all people. But the Gentiles had no idea about this in the ancient world because God was working out his plan through his chosen people, Israel, who were to be a light to the world. So Paul says, Gentiles, you were without Christ. He says, you were without citizenship or you were not part of the commonwealth. That's the second one. God made Israel into a nation. They had the protection of God. Now, sometimes they would sin and God would judge, but God was involved in this nation. Now, the Gentiles could have become a part of Israel if they would have accepted the one true God, but because they rejected God, they were not part of the blessings that God poured out on Israel. They weren't part of this kingdom. And so Paul says, 
you were not a citizen. He says to the Gentiles, you were also without covenants. They were strangers to the covenants of promise. Well, what's a covenant? Well, a covenant is sort of like a contract. It's a binding agreement. And here it was a binding agreement between God and the nation of Israel. God made covenants with the people of Israel. The major covenant being the one that God made to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. In Genesis chapter 12, God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And he did. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. And we're still talking about him. It's pretty great. And he did. He said, you'll be a blessing to the world because through the nation of Israel, this Messiah would come. You're going to bless the world. These covenants, however, were made with Israel. And so God, Paul says to the, to the Gentiles, you were without covenants. But then he says this, he says, you were also without hope. Paul says the Gentiles had no hope, and they didn't. And neither did we apart from Jesus Christ. And you know, some days this sets in on me of the helplessness and the hopelessness of the world without Jesus Christ. That we would be lost in our sins, that death would be the end. You might as well soak up that 75, 80, maybe you get 100 years, maybe you get 110 years, I don't know. That's, I probably ain't going to make it that long. But maybe you do. But then it's over and it comes to an end. It doesn't matter how much good you accomplish, it's all going to end. No hope. The great hope that, that the Gentiles didn't have was that the Messiah would come. The Gentile nations before Christ were lost in idolatry. They worshiped gods that were made out of stones and earthen material. A god, you know, of their own making, feeble. Had no hope. Their religions were powerless to help men in life or in death. The ancient world was covered in a cloud of despair. Gentiles were hopeless, as were we. Then Paul says this. He says, you were also without God. Paul notes that the Gentiles were without God. Now, now don't get me wrong. They had gods aplenty. They didn't worship the one true God. It's the same today. Many people believe in God, believe in that he exists, that he's there. makes them feel warm and fuzzy. They know, oh, there's a God out there. They don't trust him. They don't acknowledge his lordship in their lives. Many people will say, well, you know what? If you just believe in a God, if you just worship with sincerity, you're good. You can be sincerely wrong. And it doesn't matter. Peter would say in Acts 4.12 in a sermon, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's through Jesus or nothing. We're not all walking up this mountain, all the religions of the world, and at the top is God. No, no, no. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The narrow road, the gate. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Gentiles in the ancient world chose to reject God willfully. Look at what Paul says in Romans 1, 18 through 20. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We suppress the truth in our rejection of God. Verse 19, For what can be known about God is plain to them. You look at creation, you're like, oh, how did this get here? Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made. And then Paul drops this little nugget, so they are without excuse. Paul says nobody will stand before Jesus on judgment day and say, you know what, I just didn't know. Jesus says, no, no, no. Everyone is without excuse. The creation proclaims the glory of God. But God called the Jews to be a light unto all men as his chosen nation. He calls us as Christians to do the same thing. Are we doing that? Or do we look at those that are lost and say, why do you act that way? Well, I'll tell you why they act that way. Because the Bible says they've been blinded to the truth. And so I shouldn't be angry at the way non-Christians act. I should feel sorrow. I should feel brokenness because they are blinded to the truth. And it's my job, as it was the, the Jews' job, to be a light to the Gentiles. We should reflect our Creator to those around us. But Paul shows the hopelessness of a world separated from God. The Gentiles were without Christ. They were without citizenship. They were without covenants. They were without hope. Ultimately, they were without God. Paul shows their great need and our need as well, but also how poor the Jews did at being a light to the world. The Gentiles were separated from God. And the Jews and the Gentiles were separated from one another. There was this division that should not exist amongst Christians. And even today, there's division in the body of Christ. 
Now, it's okay that we don't agree about everything, but there should be charity. There should be love. There should be forgiveness. There should be acceptance. We're one people, Paul says. Now, if there's one thing I've learned about marriage, you know, I entered into marriage at the age of 26, and um, I'm 40 now, over the hill. And uh, the thing that I, you know, I know the Bible says that two become one, and I thought, what is that like? Well, as, as I've, through the years, I've learned what that's like. Me and my wife, we, we think our thoughts after one another. There's a given chance if you ask her opinion on anything, I know what she's going to say. You, we go out to a restaurant, I can probably tell you what she's going to order. I know her, and she knows me, and that's this oneness. But Paul is saying this, in the body of Christ, there should be that oneness where we belong, where we care for one another, where we encourage one another, where we forgive one another. That's what church is supposed to be. And so that's what Paul talks about. He talks about unity in Christ. Look at verse 13. Let's read this chunk of Scripture, 13 through 18, and we'll come back and, and talk about it. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off and have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's good stuff. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. Paul says those of you who were far off were brought near. Well, who was far off? Well, all of us were, right? But specifically, he's referring to Gentiles because the Jews, this was a common name for Gentiles from the Jews, they believed the Gentiles were far off and they thought they were brought near because they were under this covenant relationship with God. But what does Paul say? In Christ, every Jew and Gentile, every race, every person is brought near to God. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the root cause of every strife, division, alienation, falling out, prejudice, bitterness, fighting, all hostility, all disunity, the root cause of all that is narrowed down to one thing, and it's our sin. When the sin is washed away, all the barriers and divisions are removed, and we can live in perfect harmony. Perfect holiness produces perfect harmony. Now, I know this. Whenever my wife and I have a, a little kerfuffle, <laughs> a little spat, it's because she's a sinner. And... Believe it or not, it's because I'm a sinner. When there's disunity in our home, it didn't just enter there. It entered there because one or both of us is in a sinful moment. That's how it is. And so the next time you're arguing with your spouse, just say, the reason this is happening is because you're a sinner. And y'all let me know how well that goes, right? I do marriage counseling as well. But the truth is this. All disunity flows from the sin in my life. You know, when you think about the Trinity, this, this unique thing, when you think about God, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, all eternity, why have they never had a ripple or a fight? Because they're sinless. And so where there is not sin, there is perfect unity. And so my sin always leads to disruptions. And friends, we live in a society trying to treat the symptoms of division instead of dealing with the underlying issue. We're trying to change the way that people talk. And so in Canada, if you call somebody by the wrong pronouns, there's a very good chance that's going to be a hate crime. So if we just make people feel good and we cater to their wishes, well, well, maybe we won't have these divisions. Or change how we treat one another, which we should certainly work on that. Or raise awareness of injustice, that's fine too. Or, or create legislation. But until I deal with the underlying problem, there will always be division. And the underlying problem is my sin. Until I pursue holiness, there will always be division. This is how it is. Sin always leads to division. But the issue is in our society, nobody wants to say, hey, you know what? The reason we're having all these problems is because I'm a sinner and I do bad things. No, 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 we wanna, don't want to do that. We want to try to treat all the symptoms because I don't want to feel bad about who I am. But the truth is, who I am is rotten. 
to the core because I have this depraved, sinful nature. And until we deal with the sin, there will always be divisions among us as people. Sin always leads to division. But, thank the Lord, there's always a but. The blood of Jesus Christ says that we can have peace with God and that we can have peace with others. Look at verse 14. Let's talk about peace with God and others real quick. We're running out of time. Y'all are talking this morning. <laughs> verse 14, For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. What's the dividing wall of hostility? Well, the dividing wall was in the Jewish temple. It was this place where the Gentiles had to stop. They couldn't go into the rest of the temple. And so Paul saying this, that's done away with. That's torn away. We're, we're done with that. We are all one in Christ. There's no Jew and Gentile. There's Christians. Sin ultimately is selfishness, and selfishness is what divides us and keeps us from peace, Paul would say. This is where we get that, that paradox principle. In dying, we live. When we die to self, when we live in peace and unity. We die to self, it brings peace and unity into our lives. The only way this happens is at the foot of the cross. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. All those distinctions in the Old Testament between Jew and Gentile, which God gave to Israel so they would be distinct among the nations in a light, the food laws, uh, the ritual washings, all of this stuff, Paul says, that's done away with. Now, while we're here, I want to say this, because a lot of people will say, well, you know what, all the Old Testament law is out the window. No, no, no. The only law that was out the window in the Old Testament was the Levitical law, the ceremonial law, the moral law. What God says is right and wrong has endured from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end. It doesn't change. No longer Jew and Gentile, just Christian. Verse 16. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. No distinctions in the body of Christ. The word reconcile means to bring from hostility to friendship. Through what Christ did, we were brought into friendship with Christ, with God, also with one another. Verse 17, we're fixing to close out. And he came and preached to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Jesus took on humanness. Fully God took on humanness and he preached. What did he preach? The message of peace. The gospel. The message of reconciliation. That we can be made right with God, but that division between man can also cease. But he didn't just use words. He used his life. He preached through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He preached to all that those that were near the Jews, those that were far off the Gentiles, all men of every nation and tribe, we are one in the body of Christ. Then he goes on in verse 18 to talk about access to God, equal access, for through him we both, Jews, Gentiles, all of us, have access in one spirit to the Father. In Christ, we have access to the Father. We can approach God's throne any time, and he leans in and he gives us his ear. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can talk to God anytime you want. And there are days where I have burdens and I just have to bring them to Christ because he is the only one that will meet me there and help me shoulder these burdens. Now next Paul gives us three pictures of unity. You're going to have to study this part on your own because we're out of time. I want to be respectful of your time. But he talks about this, that, that all of us are born into one nation, into the kingdom of heaven. And if that wasn't enough, we're born into one family, God's family. And he is making us a temple on which the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, is the foundation. The church, this body of believers we're one, one nation, one family, one temple, one body, riches for all. Now I want to close out and I want to ask you a couple of questions as we close. The first one's maybe the most important question. Are you part of the family of God? Are you part of this amazing family? Have you experienced the riches of Christ's grace and mercy and forgiveness and belonging? Are you part of God's family? If you're not, I'd love to see you be a part of God's family. Question number two is this, are you bringing unity in the body or disunity? We live in a world divided, the church at large is divided. Oh, if we could just be peacemakers. Oh, if we could just be reminded that we are one in Christ. Or maybe you're here this morning and you fall into one of two categories. Maybe you have felt like an outsider your whole life. Or maybe you felt judged by Christians. Or maybe you felt uncomfortable in church. Let me remind you something. 
you can't always trust your emotions. Instead, we trust the foundational truths of God's word. And here's what God's word says. It says, as believers, as Christians, we are one. And so don't believe the lies that you're an outsider, you're a part of God's family. Or maybe you're here and you fall into another category where you're quick to judge other people. Now, the Bible says we should judge one another's sins, and there's a specific way to do that. But maybe you're quick to judge on superficialities, whether that's race, whether that's family background, whether that's just eccentricities. We can all be a little weird sometimes, amen? Maybe you're quick to judge other people. Well, maybe I would have you see that God says this morning in the book of Ephesians through the writings of Paul, that, friends, we're one. We put aside those divisions and those differences, and we focus on Jesus Christ. Let's be peacemakers because we're one, live as one, bring peace to the body. Now this morning as we close, I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer. And I want to remind you this, that people are here to pray with you. If you need to talk about joining the church, they're here to do that. If you've got a burden you want to pour out, there's somebody to listen. And so while I'm praying, if you like, there'll be somebody in this room over here and you can make your way during the prayer. And you can talk to them. And of course, I'm always available if you want to talk about something that God has put on your heart, if he's stirring something in your heart. There's always somebody here to talk with you. Church, I want to remind you that you're loved. I want you to be reminded that we are one body. Let's live as one body. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you so much again for allowing us to be here, Lord. I I pray that that's our prayer every week, that we not take this assembly for granted, Lord. Because for the past 2,000 years, there have been times where it's been very, very difficult to assemble. And so, Lord, let us give thanks. Let us give praise where praise is due. Lord, I'm thankful for your reminder that we are one in you. Lord, may that idea seek into the lives of Christians. May we be reminded that there's nothing that should divide us other than when we depart from your truth. May we cling to that. But all of these superficial differences, Lord, let us lay those aside. And let us focus on what should be focused on. Lord, I pray that we would be the salve that, that works to, to cure the problems and the divisions around us. I pray that we would show the world what it looks like to love and truly love as only you can. Lord, remind us of the hope that we have that there will come a day where all of us will sing around your throne. Where there will be no divisions, no walls, no barriers. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We're thankful that you reconciled us to yourself, that while at once there was hostility between us and you, now we can call ourselves the friends of God, the children of God. Lord, let us live as those children, and let us extend that to other people. Lord, we praise you for who you are. Be with us as we go throughout our week. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.
so much. God bless you. Have a terrific week. We'll see you guys next, next week.